Hi again, everyone. Before I introduce our lunch session, I'd like to thank Tony, Giles, and Susan for inviting me to be MC. It's been so much fun this week. It's been a great ride. It's hard to believe it's Friday already. It's been an amazing week. And on behalf of the Dallas Fed, thank you for your leadership on this week-long, thought-provoking, inspirational, catalyst for action convening of community leaders working to create change and make our region a more equitable place for its residents. And speaking of thought-provoking, inspirational, and a catalyst for action, Roslyn Dawson Thompson, President and CEO of the Texas Women's Foundation, will now lead a conversation on gender lens investing. We're gonna take a quick look at a video and then Roslyn will take it away. My current platform and passion specifically in YWAC are focuses on representation and projection, how the world views young women and especially young women of color, defining your voice again and knowing your best self, knowing what makes you hone in on your power is most important. In the past, I was actually in a troubled family environment, so I never thought that my voice was really valued. I never saw aspirational imagery that inspired me from where I was at the present time to a potentially satisfying future. In YWAC, we can reinstill that and ensure that young women of color especially are able to know that they have value, know that there's someone out there that looks like them and that they're making opportunities and spaces. Good morning and afternoon, everyone. <laughs> Delighted to be here with you. I'm Roz Dawson Thompson, and uh, thank you, Alfreda. Thank you, Tony, and all of the Big Bang team for uh, this wonderful opportunity. I get to be with some of the smartest women I've ever known in my life in this session, so I, I'm not going to spend a huge amount of time with their lengthy bios, but I am just going to tell you that Suzanne Beagle is uh, the co-founder of Catalyst at Large, co-founder and co-producer of the Global Gender Smart Investing Summit. She is one of the big thinkers and doers in the gender lens investing space globally and has moved, get this, billions of dollars through gender lens investments from her recommendations and her actions. A totally remarkable, remarkable human, Suzanne Beagle. And joining her is Kathy Clark, another totally remarkable human being. Kathy is faculty director for the Center of the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship, or CASE, and the CASE I3 Initiative on Impact Investing at the Fuquay School of Business at Duke. And these two co-conspirators, Kathy and Suzanne, have um, worked together on um, uh, certification programs around gender lens investing, which Don Hooper, <laughs> our awesome CFO and vice president of finance at the Texas Women's Foundation, um, has participated in. Um, tremendous expertise that all of these ladies possess in this very, very exciting field. And what we know and what we will be sharing with you today is the way that truly moving the needle in gender equity can be done through investing with a gender lens. So I want to lead off with Suzanne, who's joining us from London, by the way. And Suzanne, talk about why investing with an impact uh, uh, lens of, of gender, uh, your own kind of personal why, and then a, a bit of a history about the, the movement, the field. Thank you so much, Raj, and thank you so much to the Texas Women's Foundation and Big Bang for having me be part of this. And uh, I am excited to share my why uh, because it goes back about 20 years or more. Um, I built and sold a business in the tech space. And uh, as a women-led business, we were uh, very conscious about other women entrepreneurs who were growing dynamic, innovative, solution-oriented businesses who didn't have access to capital. Um, and this was in the 80s and 90s. And so when I sold my company, it just made sense to me to say, if I've got resources, this is one of the places that I want to, I want to put those resources. 
Um, I was fortunate to join the board of a foundation, Liberty Hill Foundation, um, which gave me a base to really also think about racial justice, economic justice, social justice, um, and really thinking about the problems in local communities. Um, and that really deepened my appreciation for thinking about not only the sort of investing in tech and investing in a market opportunity, but also really looking at the social issues that are facing cities and facing the country. Um, and then I joined a group called Women Donors Network, um, which is part of the way that I know you, uh, and which also really deepened my understanding around the issues that disproportionately affect women and girls, not only in the, the US, but around the world. So I felt like if I had capital, I was gonna use my capital to really work on this and the other issues that are important to me around the environment and around um, social equity and just equal opportunity and fairness. So that's my why, why do I do this? Um, a little bit about um, why the world is waking up around gender lens investing is that um, first of all, investing in women is smart. We know that investing in local resilient communities can only um, really be done well if we're thinking about all members of our communities. And so thinking about women's talent, leadership, innovation, um, em employment, all of these things, and Kathy's gonna share more with you about the kind of different lenses of gender lens investing, um, but that uh, people have realized that diverse teams outperform, that women in leadership um, have a dividend, not only a social dividend, but really a, a financial dividend, uh, and that whether you are investing in public markets or private markets, whether you're investing in a single entrepreneur in Austin or a public company in Dallas, um, that there, this just makes sense. Um, and so when I started 20 years ago deploying my own capital, there was one fund in public markets that I could invest in. There was a, some microfinance that I could get behind and there were uh, you know, a handful of venture capital funds, including Texas Women Ventures, which was one of the first in the country that to really focus on this theme. Um, but now fast forward, people coming into this today have the ability to look at um, over 50 vehicles in public markets, um, in public equities, public debt, um, to really look at gender bonds. People have heard about green bonds. A lot of people don't even know there's a thing called gender bonds. Um, and the private equity side and venture capital um, we've got uh, more than 200 funds and, and again, some superstars in Texas um, that are there from, uh, um, from Austin to Dallas and beyond. Um, and I'll, I'll name a couple of them later. Um, but to really, um, to understand that now more than three and a half billion has moved into these public market vehicles, more than 4.8 billion has moved into these private vehicles um, over the past number of years, that this is a market that's growing, it's vibrant. Um, there is so much that people can do. Again, that doesn't even count the kind of being, a, being an angel investor or being involved with crowdfunding. That's just the structured capital that's moving. And, um, and from the big banks to the pension funds, to the foundations and family offices, um, college and university endowments, this is, this is a movement. Um, that is um, really burgeoning. And so when you think about, um, again, what our opportunity is, it is to think about where gender plays a role, where you can see gender um, when you're looking at anything from affordable housing to environmental infrastructure, to food systems, to healthcare. Um, this, is a, this is an opportunity that's here and, and really dynamic. Um, when I think about, uh, you know, what I would want uh, people to know also about the linkages with racial equity, because this is obviously such uh, an important moment for us to be bringing these themes together. Um, there are tremendous, again, market needs, but also market opportunities to look at the powerhouse women founders uh, that are um, African American and Latinx. Um, the um, extraordinary companies that are targeting the women's market. Um, we know women make 80% of the purchasing decisions and in these, um, the, the market opportunity and the market need when you really understand, you know, if I'm gonna back an entrepreneur, I wanna back an entrepreneur who really understands um, what the market needs and, the, and for products and services are. 
um, in a particular market. So really looking at that opportunity um, to think about, again, we're employment, if we're creating employment and we know that small businesses, especially in small and growing businesses create most of the employment in the United States. Um, then we must be looking at where are we creating uh, employment opportunities for not only women, but women of color. Um, and as we think about the green economy and we think about the healthcare economy and the caring economy and the education economy um, to really understand where those, um, that job creation opportunity is. And the scientists and entrepreneurs, uh, the scientists and innovators. Um, I think about uh, people like the Susan and Michael Dell Foundation who have recognized uh, that um, backing uh, ambitious innovators that are women in STEM um, who are building great companies is, um, is one of the opportunities of our time and that we're missing out if we're not looking at all the talent that's there to solve the problems um, that we're really facing. So the good news is that it's growing. Uh, the challenge is that uh, it's not growing fast enough. And that, that foundations like yours, Texas Women's Foundation, are such pioneers um, in really looking at your own portfolio, moving from the grant making side to really looking at your portfolio and saying, how do we use all of our resources in this direction? Um, and there are a number of others, the Ms. Foundation um, and um, a number of your peers, um, but it's still too small and too slow. Uh, and so if there's a message that I'd wanna send as part of this framing, it's that um, there are so many opportunities that, uh, that the asset allocators, whether they're families or foundations or banks or pension funds or college and university endowments or corporates, corporate venture capital, um, don't even see. And I think a lot of what happens in, in both gender and racial equity is that there are just so many unseen, underseen, undervalued um, opportunities that are out there. And the part of what needs to happen is that people need to wake up and say, look at what's here. That's uh, it. So well, maybe I'll just stop there. I love that though, but thank you for, for, I mean, all the points that you make, Suzanne, but it's, it, you know, going back to the, the, it's not moving fast enough. We need, we need a sense of urgency to create more opportunities for resources to really be deployed. Um, and so, I turn to you, Kathy, to say, how are we going to do that? Um, wow. So, Kathy, talk to us about what it is, you know, def the definition of gender lens investing, your own why, the original way we thought about impact and how we're thinking about impact now. Sure. That's a lot. I will try to do all those things. So I'll start with my why, like Suzanne, mine goes back uh, a long ways. Um, and I'll start with my, my impact why, just to give you a sense of, and I know, you know, share with, with your foundation and many other institutions, the sense of um, kind of wonder and awe that you get when you realize when impact actually happens um, and problems are actually starting to change, right, beneath, which is the golden uh, prize that we all, uh, you know, philanthropically and individually um, care about. And so mine was actually a lunch that I had over 30 years ago with um, a president of a foundation in New York who was interviewing me for a job. He was the co-founder of Sesame Street. And I didn't realize that until I had lunch with him. And I almost choked on what I was eating when I realized that he had helped me to learn to read and basically everyone I knew because I grew up in an inner city uh, community um, in Philadelphia and just, you know, and he said, and, and this is what we are trying to do again. We are trying to take people and money and ideas and put them together at the right time to have, you know, impact on a problem. Um, and I took that job uh, because I was amazed about the potential and, and what, you know, we, we started, I didn't have the words for this at the time, but it, you know, the, the, what the power of an enterprise focused on specific outcomes could be. And that particular enterprise happened to be nonprofit. By the time I met him, which was a good deal number of years later after he started Sesame Street, he had wished he had started as a for-profit. Um, and he said, the reason is we feel that we could have scaled our impact even faster if we had been able to take in capital um, and you know, participate in the marketplace. And so that has just become a, a, a lightning rod for the rest of my career, which is what can enterprises do, no matter what their legal form, 
Um, and how can we use the, 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 you know, the small to influence the large, the, you know, what is the interaction between sectors? Um, and then how can capital um, really propel the things that you care about? Um, and so, you know, now as a professor of social entrepreneurship and impact investing, um, you know, have, I have become, I have, I have worked, you know, across many different areas, education, health, uh, microfinance, financial inclusion, community development, you know, all the, all the, the programs that, that we, that, that we use, um, and realize that, you know, this, this idea of equity, diversity, inclusion, whether that's for gender or for uh, other, you know, race and other things, um, is, is a hugely powerful value. Um, and so to me, the, the, the amazing thing about gender lens investing is to say, well, how do I actually take that value or my values that I might have and, and make that actionable in the world, right? And what power do I have to do that either with my own money or with other institutions money? And so, um, you know, we know, for example, I know that there was a, a session earlier today, uh, uh, you know, talking about impact investing writ large, impact investing is exploding, right? We have um, private markets uh, where we have up to, uh, the latest is about 700 billion that's being invested for impact through private um, funds um, and enterprises. And on the public market where, you know, people have been uh, um, using their endowments or other, um, you know, larger portfolio of assets, um, there is much more attention to, well, what can I do with those assets to tilt them towards uh, things that I care about and, and using environmental, social and governance sorts of um, tools to do that. And we're up to almost 30 trillion uh, of assets doing that, right? So now is a great time to be thinking about gender because there is a, there is a, there is a, a kind of a groundswell of interest among institutions who are holding these assets to figure out ways to, uh, to align them with what their stakeholders care about. And that's not even talking about global goals like the sustainable development goals and other things that have allowed, you know, over 190 governments around the world to say, here are the things we care about. Here are the things that we want your assets to try to address. Um, and so people can collaborate because we have a roadmap. Um, and so I think, you know, that's what um, has, has driven me. What the other um, amazing thing over the past few years is that Suzanne and I have known each other a very long time, but we got together a few years ago and we said, could we help people to do this faster? As she said, it's not fast enough. You know, these goals, the sustainable development goals are a great example. They have a, they have a timeline of trying to achieve them by 2030. 10 years is not a long time uh, to end poverty and, <laughs> and do all the things that are, that are part of those goals. And so we put together a training program uh, called Getting Gender Smart to help um, uh, uh, individuals and institutions uh, go along this path a little, a little further. And so one of the first things that we did, and I'm going to share my screen in a minute, um, is we said, well, when you're thinking about gender lens investing, why are we calling it a lens and what does that mean? Um, and the idea of a lens is just a little bit with what Suzanne ended with, which is there are a lot of opportunities out there. And what we need to do is sharpen the way that we are filtering uh, what we see um, and, and recognize what, what we can pull, put into focus and actually concentrate on. And then we also realized, and I am gonna share my screen now, um, we also realized that um, there were uh, a, a several different lenses that, that people can use um, and that those lenses um, have you know, different impacts on the world. Uh, trying to get that to, to show big, can you guys see that? Yeah. Great. Uh, so I just wanted to go through these to give a little more detail to the conversation that we're having because um, to, to us, gender lens investing is not one thing. Um, we have six different lenses uh, that are commonly in use by people doing gender lens investing. And I just wanted to go through these very briefly. So the first one is women as investors. Um, first of all, before I go through these, let me just say we are looking at what are the things people can do to intentionally incorporate gender-based factors um, into their analysis, their financial analysis to get better outcomes, but we are not solely talking just about women and we are not talking about counting women. We're talking, you know, we realize that gender is a fluid concept, that women, uh, women's impacts affect men's outcomes as well. And we also recognize that there are other layers of intersectionality and diversity that affect all these things. So let me just give that as the backdrop. So for the lenses, 
Women as investors is when women are showing up as private or institutional investors, deploying their own or others' capital, um, and making becoming part of the decision making process, which is really a, a, a you know inf influencing and and using power um, within the financial system. The second is women who are uh, showing up as workers uh, or owners in the supply chain, where there are a lot of issues about uh, employment whether that's in the informal economy or the formal economy um, and an opportunity to you know, shift outcomes for those women and norms around them within the enterprise. So within any company, there are different levels that every company touches that, that can be, can be you know, honed in on with a gender lens. The access to capital is basically looking at women as fund managers, as founders, as owners, and that can be you know, micro businesses, small and growing businesses, multinational corporations, right? All the way across. Um, what is the, this is you know, one of the things that is, 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 is easiest to have statistics on, how many women have access to different kinds of capital. And I can assure you right now, it's still very low. We have a long way to go um, and, and other issues. Women in leadership is about <clears throat> what are women, what are the roles that women are in? Are they leading the company's board? Are they in the C-suite? Are they in senior management? What are the ladders of progression? Um, what is the activity actually going on with the company to support that? And can you improve it? Products and services is around, is around what are the um, uh, products or services that address the needs of women or girls um, and can also include uh, ways to provide equitable access to products that might be gender neutral, but that might, might not be reaching women and girls. And then the last one is uh, workplace equity. Um, which relates to the leadership that we talked about, which is, you know, what is the gender balance? What's the pay parity? Um, what is the equity across roles? And what are the policies and practices that companies can put into place to support greater equity? So there's a lot of behavior change in here. Um, and I'm going to turn off my slide in a second. The, the right side is a list of some of the dividends. So what are the benefits? of using an, a, a gender lens or using some of these gender lenses, what are the benefits that accrue <clears throat> back to the company and or society? And that's just a, a set of some of them. Um, so that is what I wanted to cover to begin with. Um, and I'm happy- Well, thanks for setting that stage because I think it's important to see that it's not like a lens, <laughs> but it is a series of lenses through which we can view um, our world, our opportunities, and uh, the financial realities that we might be embracing. So I love that. Thank you. Um, Don, I want to turn to you, and, and Don's going to tell the story of our journey <laughs> as Texas Women's Foundation. Uh, but first, you know, talk about your own personal why, Don, and then kind of our organizational why and how we have managed to kind of break through as um, two years ago, the first of the women's foundations to make this commitment. I would be honored to do that, Ross. Thank you. Um, first, I've been with the foundation just under four years. And one of the things that drove me um, to make a move to the foundation was really my goal to get closer to the mission. And the mission for Texas Women's Foundation is to in, invest in the power of women and girls to drive positive change. Um, normally, we talk about that through our research, through our advocacy, programming, and grant making. Um, but we're now at a point where that word in our mission, it, the invest word, can take on a whole new meaning as we look at taking every asset that we have and um, putting it to work for women and girls. And Four years ago, I would have never thought that I would be in charge of leading and being a major uh, driver in part of the mission. And so I'm super excited that I get this opportunity at Texas Women's Foundation, and um, it's made it a delight. It was one of the first things that I was introduced to that was totally new for me coming into the foundation. Um, and I've learned a lot and made personal changes in my own investments, as well as um, get to enjoy watching Texas Women's Foundation on the journey. I'm gonna take you back um, 10 years. And when we talk about this being something that should have urgency, I really feel like the landscape has changed such that no one else should be taking 10 years to get to where um, they're investing um, more of their assets in a social change way. But know that this doesn't happen overnight really for 
um, too many people. So in 2011, um, then Dallas Women's Foundation only had 2% of its assets in socially responsible investments, and that was through a global sustainability fund. But that same year at the Women's Funding Network um, global meeting in May, our then chair, Diane Dutton, board chair, um, set through a presentation on gender lens investing um, and really saw the great opportunity to advance gender equity through our investments. So coming back from that meeting, Roz was coming on board as a brand new president and CEO and they shared that exciting program with her and together they established the gender lens investing subcommittee whose job was really to explore what we could do through our investments um, to advance gender equity. So in a very short period of time, really just a few months, that team got to work, learn more of the landscape and put together a presentation to our board in February of 2012 and brought on board Jackie Vanderberg to lead that discussion. She was a, leading, a leader in the emerging sector of gender lens investing. And of course she got the, the board super excited about the opportunity as well. In the very next month, the gender lens task force was born um, to do two things. One, figure out what should our strategy be as we were looking at the 2013-2015 strategic plan, and then to put some structure around what we would be doing. So that strategic plan um, was to become a leading participant in the movement of gender lens investing. So at that time, that was pretty bold. Um, and that team went right to work. It was also called the Impact First Committee. And the traditional investment advisory committee was the finance first committee and they worked side by side. But the primary funding for the impact first team was our operational funds that could be used for investments. Whereas the finance or the investment advisory committee was looking at our donor advised funds and our endowments. So the impact first team really needed to look at separate policy guidelines from the investment committee. There were different risk tolerances involved, market cycles, liquidity needs, et cetera. They were able to put this all in place and started looking at opportunities to invest or collaborate with others so that there would be a positive and sustainable social and economic impact in the lives of women and girls through our investments. So very quickly from getting things set up, um, they took to the board in October of that year, 2012, an opportunity to invest in what Susanna has already mentioned as a great venture capital fund here in Texas, which was the Texas Women's Venture um, Fund, it's venture capital funding for women-led, women-owned businesses. Um, within a couple of years, as they continue to look at other opportunities and knowing that there needed to be a little diversity in the type of investments that the foundation was in, they invested in two different micro loan funds that had focuses on women entrepreneurs. And these were low interest rate, PRI kind of investments if you're with the Family Foundation. Um, and that was in February of 2015. In August of 2016, which was still a little ways out from there, the foundation also invested in um, a social enterprise, many of you know, the ECOLA organization that was pulling women out of sex trafficking um, situations and teaching them jewelry making um, for a wonderful um, retail business, Ecola. Today, Texas Women's Foundation is still invested in Texas Women's Ventures and the two micro loan funds with the uh, Ecola loan being repaid earlier than planned. And those funds are sitting there waiting for future investments. And then the next strategic planning session, which was 2015 to 2018, um, the excitement had continued and the landscape continued to grow. grow. So the, the goal was set a little bit higher and the foundation decided that we needed to make um, a move and be really a leader in general lens investing. And we actually put numbers to the strategy this time. We targeted eight to 12% of our net assets would be gendered invested by 2018. At this time, we pulled together the impact first and the finance first committees and brought them into a single investment advisory committee. Since we were um, seeking to move a large amount of our assets that would include our endowment and donor advice funds. So it only made sense to pull those two together. Plus the landscape um, and learning had advanced to a place where we knew we weren't necessarily looking at PRI related investments, but that we could do this and not 
uh, have any um, risk, additional risk associated because we were moving investments um, to social focus. And in order to make that move, um, the foundation had to make some changes. So we began an RFP in 2015 to choose a new custodian and new advisor. We moved to a large institution that had a equity strategy around women and girls equality. Um, and there was 23.5 million that we moved over there. And through that relationship by 2018, we had 23% of our assets in gendered lens plus our direct investments. So we were more than achieving the goal we set in our strategic plan. As we were coming out of 2018, we had just closed a large $50 million campaign, which um, also moved us into rebranding from Dallas Women's Foundation to Texas Women's Foundation and had us expanding across the state. So we created a bold new goal, which many of you may have heard. Um, we had a goal to invest 100% of our assets in impact. Um, again, we knew we needed partners to do this with um, that had more knowledge than than some of us, even though we had a wonderful investment advisory committee with some very experienced um, women on that committee that also had experience in impact investing. In 2019, uh, the RFP focused specifically on finding a partner with experience in ESG investing. And at that time we selected Morgan Stanley's Greystone Consulting Office out of Chicago. It's a women led, um, investment consulting firm. And uh, in November of 2019, we moved $27 million in our assets, making Texas Women's Foundation the first women's foundation with a fully gendered investment portfolio. Greystone was wonderful at coming in and working with our investment committee to put together a um, investment policy statement that addressed our specific ESG focus and also caused us to think hard about what does our gendered lens look like? As Kathy said, there's a lot of ways that we could have approached that. We made the decision to define our gender lens as any investment that makes the world a better place for women and girls. We ensured that 100% of our assets have been screened against um, any investments that would harm women and girls. And we knew that we did not want it to compromise returns um, so since we moved those investments in November of last year, we have added, I think, at least 10 new donor advice funds, including one very large donor advice fund that moved from another foundation, specifically because of our gender lens investing. And then if you were listening to Big Bang earlier this week, you heard about the If Then program with Lighty Hill Philanthropies. And so adding that as well to our donor advice funds um, because of uh, those funds can be working for women and girls while the if then program is getting started and we will be sending those funds out. We've also added about 10 new named endowments. Um, and as of the end of this last fiscal year in June, our invested assets are up over 28% from prior year. We've really tried to create a learning environment for impact investing. We bring in our donor advice fund holders and named endowment donors on a quarterly basis and share with them what we're doing with the investments, the financial returns, the social returns. And we continue to look at um, direct investing um, and have a current strategy to drive funding to women entrepreneurs as we've already heard, um, that being one of the key gender lenses. Um, so we, I continue to look forward to learning along this journey and leading the foundation in our gender lens investing. Thank you, Dawn. Yep, and we we are always looking for the kind of the next opportunity of where where this field emerges and how we can participate in it. Which leads me to ask you, Kathy, <laughs> what are the next opportunities in gender lens investing? And I'm, I'd like you to talk about that, but also would love for you to talk about measurement and the whole concept of how do we know we have impact? How do we know that the the gender lens strategy is really delivering. So you can take them in either order if you want, but I'd love to hear you talk about both. Thank you. I'm going to take them in the opposite order and try to link them together. Um, you know, there's a, been a lot of progress around the notion that, you know, if you're going to use some sort of impact lens, gender or not, 
um, you know, you need to do two things well. One is, as John just said, you need to articulate what your intention is around that lens. Is it, you know, is it a small, is it a large, what's in, what's out, what are you hoping to see um, at the end? Um, and, you know, often investors, uh, you know, make the initial, uh, you know, kind of uh, frame for that pretty large so they can see a lot of things. But then within that, what are the outcomes that you're really trying to get to? Um, and what kind of data uh, can you get back for the second part of it, which is how can you make sure that your performance is actually accountable to what you hope is happening? Um, and then, you know, exercise more power if it either is or isn't, right? So it's not just plunking your money into something and hoping for the best. The, 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 this whole field only works when um, there, is an, there, is a, there is a flow of information that is both efficient for the people creating it and useful uh, for the people making decisions. And of course, in the impact investing space, there's kind of a capital chain for that, right? So often... Um, a foundation, for example, who owns assets is dependent on the funds that they invest in and maybe the enterprises that those funds invest in, right, to create a chain of information that flows back up for them to be able to say, and you could imagine for the lenses that we talked about, there's actually different information that you would need to know. How many women use this product um, is very different from how many women are on the board. And it's going to cost you a different amount of, uh, you know, effort and, and money to ascertain the answers to those things. So that's all to say that the good news is, is that I think the field is growing in sophistication about how to do this across the whole value chain to make it easier for larger pots of money to know that some things are, are, are happening that they care about. And I also think that um, the smaller pots of money in the private field have gotten really, really good at deep, rigorous assessment. And so just to give you a sense of the layers of that, right? there are new principles um, that the IFC and others have put out around, what are the kinds of practices that you wanna see in a fund that's trying to be accountable to impact, which can include gender? Um, there are now emerging standards around what are the different ways that that fund should um, integrate this into their strategy. Is this, is this something that's just going to be on paper or are they actually changing what they do every day um, and you know, ways to ascertain that? Um, there are reporting systems um, so that you know, uh, Dawn and Roz want to say, what is you know, on a quarterly basis, what can we learn not just about the financial performance of our portfolio, but what can we start to learn about what's going to actually happen around gender? Um, and what can we reasonably expect to see from that? Um, and so there's a, a great deal of activity around that, both from um, you know, uh, uh, people trying to set frameworks that are, that are around kind of financial sustainability and much more, many more frameworks around kind of what are all the stakeholders that this, that, that this business is accountable to um, and how can we understand that? So getting to your second question, which is kind of what are the opportunities given that growth in the rigor on the impact side, um, I feel like, and I will ask Suzanne to step in on some of this because she's behind some of this research. We just know a lot more. We know a lot more about the public um, funds and products that are addressing gender. We know how many they are, we know what they're focused on, we know how they're growing, we know how they're doing, right? So there's a, there's a menu to choose from, which didn't exist just a few years ago, um, which is really exciting. And then on the, um, on the, the um, you know, kind of private versus public, I feel like there's also just a much better awareness that there's certain kinds of impacts you can do with a public company and there's certain kinds of impacts you can do with a private company and you can blend them. Um, and, and understanding that you, know, you can take your dollar and get a company to reduce what it's doing that's harmful and that might be hugely impactful at scale. And you can also do something you know, for a few hundred women um, intensely in a community and that's also impactful. And so this idea that you can have different kinds of goals and array them because we have better information about all of that. I don't know, Suzanne, if you want to jump in on, on the, the, the awareness of the different options that I just think is cranking up every, every year. Please do. I think it is. And I think part of what's exciting, too, is that even with all those options, there are 
women and men who are investing with the gender lens who are saying, what I want isn't out there. So I'm going to help create it. Mm -hmm. So I think about women that I'm very inspired by, two philanthropists in particular, one who has a foundation called Tara Health. And she was looking for something that was a fund to invest in innovations to provide more access and affordability for contraception in the United States, especially for marginalized communities. Um, and so she helped start something called Rhea Ventures, um, which is a venture capital fund investing in those solutions. Um, another woman from, with the Forsythia Foundation who was obsessed about the amount of toxins in our products. Um, and so she's helped really use her own capital to help um, spur a new fund called Safer Made which is about really bringing the whole green technology side along with really environmental health and thinking especially about women's health. And so um, that's part of the opportunity too, is to look at what's out there today, but then also to say, um, as I think you guys are, um, you know, what do we care about? What do we care about? What are the issues we care about? What are the problems we wanna solve in our local communities and our global community? Um, where's also, where are the trends? Um, and to say, if the fund that we want doesn't exist or the vehicle we want doesn't exist, then we're gonna help create it. Um, so I think it's the combination of the two of understanding what's out there that you can do. Um, and then also saying, what's not yet out there? How can I be the first money in um, for True Wealth Ventures or Artemis Fund or Beyond Capital or these extraordinary fund managers that are based in Texas that in some cases are investing in Texas, in some cases are investing around the world, who, who, need the, who needed that first capital to come in. And all of them are now off and running, doing extraordinary things, but somebody needed to be there to really be that first capital in. Um, and so maybe just if I think about like, what's my call to action and what's my call to um, really think about the opportunity here, that again, this is about local resilient economies and it's about global resilient economies and a fairer, more equal world for everybody. And to see gender lens investing as the, again, the lens for opportunity to say, where can I be a smarter investor? Where can I have more impact by paying attention to, to this? And we know the vehicles are there. We know um, that the women leaders and innovators are there and the business case is there. And we've been, you already know about the social case of why this makes sense and why it's so needed. Um, but that, uh, now is the moment for people to really come out and say, we are going to allocate as you have at Texas Women Ventures. We are, we are gonna not just look at this as a, a sideline, something small, but really as something core. Um, and we're talking about a multi-trillion dollar market opportunity if we, and increase in GDP, increase in, um, uh, in tax revenue for cities, if they would just pay attention to backing women at the same level as backing men. So, one of the things you asked me ahead of the call was how can people participate? What can they do if they wanna get involved? And I thought, start by understanding what you're already invested in and where, again, whether you're looking at a gender lens or gender and racial equity lens, um, what are you already in? Um, and um, think about your portfolio, think about your own advisors and are they ready, willing and able to help you? Um, think about your uh, the, the things that you are focused on um, in the world, whether that is a sector or a geography or a theme um, or, a, or a type of, even of business models, a type of business that, you know, there are a lot of people who say, I, I'm a tech person. I only want to invest in tech enabled ventures, or I'm obsessed about um, food security or climate change. You know, where, where do you want to be? Um, and, and there is a way to have a gender lens in all of these. Um, so it's think about your own priorities, think about what measures you can take to move as you did with Texas Women's Foundation, move your board, move your trustees, move your advisors along, uh, along that continuum. And there are so many resources now. Um, and you have, I know so many within Texas um, Women's Foundation, but the local angel networks, um, the impact investing networks um, and the um, the advisors that have now really come on board, um, as I know we heard from Jen Kenning this morning, um, who really have that expertise. Um, and so to, to take that maybe Texas competitiveness um, and thinking big and going big or staying home um, and saying now is this moment to really do it. Um, and, to, and you have so many incredible innovators right there, but you have the ability um, to spot innovators anywhere. Um, and to really just say, we're just going to get it done. Um, and, that, and that this is the moment to make that happen. So that's my 
um, uh, that's my call to action for all of you is to just think about what role you want to play and um, who you're going to do it with. I love that. And I want to go back and echo, you know, some of the things, Suzanne, that you that you suggested we do that are within all of our power. You know, who's running your money? You know, we all can go ask those questions and and ask them in in very uh, pertinent ways. But I think the, the that we don't we have not necessarily as investors, women and, 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 and men alike, but women in particular, have not necessarily been um, prone to ask, um, which is unconscionable, but it's true, you know? And so, but then when we do ask and we get the different answer, uh, there is a reason that, um, Many uh, women, when they are either widowed or divorced, immediately change their money manager because they've been talked down to and talked at and not listened to. Um, and so the, the opportunity for women to truly uh, be investors with an active you know, sensibility and encourage men to also invest in, with a gender lens because it is the right thing to do. It is the effective thing to do. And uh, so I do have a question that, that came in over the transom that I wanted to ask. Um, Ross, can I just say one thing please. about yes. men as investors? So I was following uh, Mark Cuban's tweets, uh, another you know great Texan uh, who said, I just got it that um, you know half my portfolio um, is women entrepreneurs because it's just smart um, and they're doing smart things. And so, you know, I think this is also really imperative to realize that um, both men and women can realize that this is just smart investing. Absolutely. And this question, I'm going to, I'm going to do a partial answer and then I'm going to ask each of you to weigh in on it as well. This is how, where would I go to take the first step in investing in women owned enterprises? And I think, you know, I will offer up us as a first step is that we have pooled funds that are investing in, you know, direct investments. It's a, it's a venture philanthropy play as opposed to a direct investment play for those who contribute to our funds. Uh, but we're offering that, as Dawn said, a learning environment so that one can experiment as a donor to us and one of these direct investing funds, learn about it and then take your own portfolio forward. So that's one method, but talk about where do I go to invest in women-owned enterprises? You mentioned angel networks, you've mentioned some of these others. Run back through that list of, of, of truly awesome opportunities that exist across this whole market of ours. Okay, well, I'll just keep, there's so, I could, I could take an hour to tell you about this, but I'm just going to give you a couple of quick ideas. Number one, there are local, great local angel networks across Texas. So um, that is one place to go. It's a place to learn. It's to co-invest. Um, it's ex Kathy Clark and I met through um, so Investor Circle, which is now called Social Venture Circle. Um, and it was a way that I learned about how to be an investor. Um, and, I, and I was focused on women-led enterprises, but um, that that's one good idea, right? The second um, is to invest in funds that are investing in women entrepreneurs. Um, and so I mentioned some of them, True Wealth and Artemis and Beyond Capital, and um, there are a host of funds. Um, that's Those are just the ones that are based in Texas. Um, the third is um, I'm part of something called CEO, which is... Uh, me too, me too. They're so great. <laughs> It's an incredible global network, and it's in Canada, U.S., Australia, New Zealand, and now the U.K., uh, and it's women investing in women, um, and it's the, the spirit of radical generosity. Um, it's an incredible community. We're backing the most extraordinary ventures from someone making straws out of seaweed to someone who's doing packaging that's biodegradable to someone who's solving um, the challenge of um, getting uh, test, animal testing out of the picture by um, putting mini brains on chips and um, enable people, enabling people to do testing um, uh, using AI. I mean, it's just extraordinary what, what's coming through this network. So CEO.world is a, another really, really great place to go. And then there's so many more, but I'll just end there. Uh, that's awesome. Kathy, what about, what about your suggestions in terms of getting people into the, in the door? 
I, they're very similar to Suzanne's. I would just, you know, there, there's a, there, there are a lot of intermediaries, whether it's angels or other investment groups that you can join locally or nationally. Um, and then Suzanne has actually been part of a great research project at the Wharton School of Business called Project Sage, where there's a database and a list of all of the funds that focus on women-owned yeah. enterprises. So it's all there for you. You don't even have to Google it. You can just go. Um, and you know, this is, this is easier. Yeah. Thank yeah. you for mentioning Project Sage. So Project Sage 3.0, if you just Google that, um, it's 138 funds and you can see them all side by side. And um, it, it's a great resource. Well, and that's, I, that was one of the things when Suzanne and I first met, you were beginning the, the aggregation of that data. And I, I was just so incredibly impressed with the vision behind that. And the fact that we were all looking, we were all looking for the door, you know, like everybody was saying, where's the door? I want, I want in. And, um, and not, and, and nowhere was there a place to find uh, the door and all the richness behind it. So th that you have accomplished that with Wharton is just uh, a remarkable uh, gift to the whole movement. So, and I, and I want to say also, um, you know, 25%, 24.6% of those funds have not only a gender diversity uh, focus, but also a racial equity focus. There you go. Um, so somebody is saying right now in, in the context of Black Lives Matter, in the context of thinking about what's going on in the world, and they say, I want to invest in women, but I, I really also really want to think about um, Black and Brown women and Indigenous women um, to really look at those funds that have um, those, that intersectionality to it as well. It's, it's critical. It, it is the moment for it. And the billion dollar fund that just got announced, you know, I mean, this, we're not talking uh, going small. We're talking going going really big as we should and we must. Um, I think of Tracy Gray and her her statement when we were all talking about you know the fund that she was creating to invest in women of color owned and founded businesses. And she said, you know, I had to I had to go do it because it didn't exist. And the funding that was coming from venture capital to uh, women owned businesses is pitiful enough, you know, 3%. But as she said, the amount going to women of color owned businesses is a rounding error. It's 0.003%. So the, to your earlier point, Suzanne, the opportunity is now to like go big, get big, get more. Um, it's a burgeoning real market delivers real incredible returns on both the social and financial basis. And um, it's not something to just go put a little bit. Well, um, it's, it's almost from a financial perspective. If you, if, if, if the world works the way we want and this field grows, you know, the, the, the opportunity to make outsized returns might actually get smaller because there's so yeah. many people who are running amazing businesses who are being overlooked for reasons that don't have anything to do with their business. There you go. And I, I want to say also back to Tracy Gray, um, and her fund is called the 22 Fund and it's in Los Angeles and it's really looking at the market opportunities again for job creation in yes. LA um, for export ready businesses, especially with a climate and, and environmental focus like sort of good new green jobs and and what are we doing to reskill and retrain people for good new green jobs um, but I love one of her quotes which is whether you have a piggy bank or you own a bank you can be a gender lens investor uh, <laughs> and um, so I love talking about billions but I also really love talking about the fact that for a hundred dollars you can be an investor in C note or Calvert Impact Capital's um, uh, notes uh, or That's right. that this is really something that we it's a moment to say whatever capital you have, um, you can really uh, play a role. I, I think that. the key is get started and get started today. Um, and there's lots of opportunities and uh, I echo Suzanne's SAGE project because that sort of put it simple for me um, to see in front of me what's available. And if, if you've got an investment advisor, engage that investment advisor today, whether you're an individual trying to invest or you're investing corporate or foundation dollars, start having the conversation. 
the the Suzanne say the name again the Wharton project is project yeah. it's from Wharton social impact initiative and it's called project sage s-a-g-e 3.0 great and just Perfect. google that it'll, it'll come right to the website you'll get to it <laughs> Oh, and we want to offer uh, everyone uh, on the call the resources of contacting us at Texas Women's Foundation. We're happy to, again, ex you know, ex tell you more about our journey and, and the opportunities that we've had um, the, the uh, delight to uh, be involved with. And that this is, it, this is so mission revelatory. I mean, it's just you know, we, we cannot solve for issues of women and girls with philanthropy alone. There will not ever be enough money. But when we truly embrace the possibilities of capital markets and moving big money and little money toward these goals, uh, profound and amazing things can transpire. And as I've said this uh, whole week, I'm, I'm approaching the world now with a spirit of hope that given everything that's gone on in our world, um, all the terrible things that have gone on in our world of racial injustice uh, being so adamantly revealed and um, the gender injustice and the disparities that we see in every corner, we also have a moment right now. And so whether it's your piggy bank or you own the bank, Take the action now. There is no, there is no excuse for waiting when we are living in this moment and this time. So I, I thank you all for being here. Suzanne, thank you for coming across the ocean via Zoom <laughs> to be with us. What a joy and a pleasure to get to be with all of you, such incredible change makers. And, and I just want to echo... Um, in this moment where the, with COVID and climate and the economic crisis and it, everything that's going on, um, these investing in these kinds of companies and funds is my source of hope. Um, I just think about, um, uh, I just made an investment in a woman-led business in Kenya, which is about basically being the Amazon.com for uh, menstrual health products and contraception. Um, I've invested in a computer games company in Israel, which is doing games for girls. I've invested in a company called Land It, which is um, about uh, women and women of color, especially succeeding a business in uh, whatever role that they're in. And these entrepreneurs and these businesses are my source of hope. And so I just think um, uh, CEO, all the businesses I get to be part of, um, people should do this because it's a smart business. People should do this because it's smart investing but also because this is how we are going to change the world. I think so too. And with that, let's just go do it. <laughs> Kathy, thank you. Thank you so much for being part of this. Dawn, of course, I cherish you as a colleague and a leader in our organization. Suzanne, always, always a joy to be with you. So thank you all. And we're going to sign off. Bye, everybody. Wow, that was an extraordinary session and no doubt the time is now. We have a long way to go toward gender equity, but it was incredible to hear from brilliant leaders who are making transformative moves in their investing practices toward a world that is equitable for women and girls. Enormous thanks to Rosalind Dawson Thompson, and Don Hooper at Texas Women's Foundation for organizing that incredible session, Kathy Clark of Duke University, Suzanne Beagle of Gender Smart Investing Summit for joining us. All of today's sessions.